Hey everyone. Hey guys. Welcome to another Travel Therapy Mentor video. Tonight we're going to be doing a recap of our um, our summer in Alaska, the road trip there, the road trip back, the three months we spent there on contract. Um, I know speaking for myself, Whitney and I, we've talked a lot about this, but for me specifically, I think this was probably the best summer we've ever had. It was a really awesome time in Alaska. I really encourage um, any of you guys that haven't taken contracts there to at least consider it. Um, it's just a, a great place in the summer. We can't really speak for the other seasons, but um, the summers are amazing. So uh, Whitney's gonna introduce us. I'm gonna get this video shared in a couple groups and then uh, we'll jump into it. All right, hey everyone. For those that may not know us, my name is Whitney Aiken. I'm Jared Kazazo. And we're both traveling doctors of physical therapy. We've been travel PTs for over seven years now. Uh, we've traveled all over the country. We've mostly worked on the East Coast um, with the exception of our contracts in Hawaii and now Alaska. But uh, via road trips, we've been able to visit all 50 states. Um, these days, for those of you guys who may not be familiar with our lifestyle, we don't work full time anymore. Um, we only work usually about one contract a year and then some PRN at home and the rest of the year. Uh, we spend traveling and doing other things. So we've really um, taken advantage of our lifestyle as travel therapists and we love it. Um, but as Jared said, Alaska was one of our greatest experiences yet. And so we highly encourage you guys to consider Alaska um, in the future for your own travels. We can't wait to tell you guys more about it. Um, we try to do these videos every few weeks. Uh, we talk about all kinds of different travel therapy topics. So if you are new to our page, you can go back on our Facebook page and watch um, any of our old videos or listen to a lot of them, the newer ones on our podcast, on Spotify or Apple Podcasts or other platforms. Um, thank you guys who have listened before and tuned in. I know we have um, quite a few regular listeners, so we appreciate you guys tuning in. For those of you that are watching live on Facebook, we'd love if you'd say hello in the comments and let us know you are watching. Or even if you watch later on the replay, you can say hey in the comments. Um, I see a few of you guys on. Hi, Spencer. Hi, Susan. Hey, Kathleen. Hey, Nick. How are you guys? Um, we'd love if you'd let us know in the comments, those of you guys that are watching live, um, are you a current traveler? Are you someone who's thinking about traveling? Are you a student? What's your discipline? Um, if you are a current traveler, let us know where you are currently. Hey, Diane. Thanks for joining. Um, Diane was actually our recruiter for um, our job in Alaska. So hi, Diane. Thanks for tuning in. Um, so anyway, for those of you guys that are watching live, just say hey in the comments. Um, Jared's going to get the video shared in a couple of groups so that more people can just tune in with us live. Also, shout out to you guys that will listen later on the podcast. So we appreciate you. We do want to remind you guys about a couple of giveaways that we're going to be doing at the end of the year. Um, and that's quickly approaching. Like, how is it already September? It's kind of crazy. Time flies. So um, one of the giveaways we're doing is for folks that leave us reviews on social media. So for those of you that watch us on Facebook and are active on our Facebook page, we'd love if you would leave us a review on our Facebook page. Just go to Travel Therapy Mentor, the business page, click on reviews, take you two minutes to leave us a review. We'd really appreciate your feedback. Um, all you have to do is send us a screenshot of your review. Just send us a message on Facebook or email. Um, Instagram, wherever, and we'll enter you to win um, the drawing, which is gonna be for $100. You can also leave us a review on Apple Podcasts if you're somebody who listens on the podcast. Again, same thing, quick review, screenshot it, send it to us, you'll get entered to win the drawing. $100 which, uh, Amazon gift card, Amazon or Airbnb. Yep, yeah. um, and so that'll be done at the end of the year. The other giveaway that we are doing at the end of the year is for folks that take jobs with some of our recommended recruiters. Um, so a lot of you guys reach out to us for recruiter recommendations and also for jobs that you're interested in that are on our hot jobs list. Um, for anybody who has taken a contract in 2020, 2022 with any of our recommended recruiters, you are already eligible for this giveaway. All you need to do is just fill out the form and uh, let us know. Um, and that way you guys can give us some feedback about your experience with the recruiters and your contract and then we'll get you entered to win. And that drawing is gonna be four different winners um, I can't remember if we said four winners, two fifty each, or I think five it's winners, five, two hundred dollars each. So five of you guys will win um, two hundred dollar gift cards each. So get your entries in for those. We have a couple months left till the end of the year um, to enter for either one of those giveaways. All right, so we'll dive right into talking about Alaska. So for many of you guys that may have been following us on social media, you might know that we spent the last several months uh, traveling to Alaska, working in Alaska, and then we just got back home uh, to our home in Virginia. Um, as you mentioned, this is, was one of our favorite contracts for a lot of reasons. So as far as the actual contracts go, we both worked. We both took travel PT contracts in Anchorage, Alaska. And this is a really special contract because we requested to work part-time. 
because we knew that there was a lot that we were going to want to do in Alaska and a lot to explore there. And we didn't really want to be working 40 hours a week. Um, in addition to that, we also maintain our online business, Travel Therapy Mentor. So we have a lot to do throughout the week for our online business. So it's really hard for us to work full time in the clinic these days. So we were able to negotiate a contract where we each only worked two days a week which was phenomenal. Um, if you guys get to a point of financial stability where you can work only part-time, highly recommend it because it was so nice only being in the clinic two days a week. It was just enough to really enjoy our patient care and enjoy what we were doing, but also have so much flexibility throughout the week to do other things and explore. Um, we got a lot of questions when we first talked about doing this like part-time contract because a lot of people were like, oh, I didn't know you could do part-time travel therapy and you even make enough money to make it worth it, those sort of questions. So as far as whether you can do it, it's not common, uh, but we have done it a couple times and we found that it just depends on the facility and you just basically have to ask. Um, you have to have your recruiter you know, look around for you. You might have to shop around a little bit to find a facility that is willing to do that for you, but it's not common. It's not usually listed. Most travel therapy jobs are listed as you know, 32 to 40 hours a week, um, just a standard job, but in certain circumstances, you might be able to negotiate it. Yeah, everything in travel is negotiable. So if you have something like that, you really want part-time contracts or um, certain days of the week or uh, four tens instead of five eight-hour shifts, things like that, a lot of times the clinic owners will work with you. It just depends on what they need though. So there's no clear answer across the board. Every situation is different. Um, so you just kind of have to approach it you have to be flexible, you have to tell your recruiter what you're looking for, and then if the recruiter knows some insight about the different jobs available, they might be able to point you in the right direction, submit you for the jobs that they think might uh, be willing to work with you on that, or, uh, or at least they can get you in contact with the manager and uh, you can tell them what you want and uh, see if that's something that they can accommodate. Yeah, um, and as a pair, some other strategies that we used also were trying to see if our recruiters could submit us for just one full-time job and then if we were to have the opportunity to get the interview we thought about discussing with them hey would you be willing to let the two of us split one caseload so that was an opportunity that we were going to pursue um, but we never even ended up having to go that route because we found a clinic owner um, at an outpatient clinic that was willing to work with both of us because he had four different locations in the same city and so he basically used us almost like prn but we had a set schedule two days a week um, with that said the times that we've done part-time travel therapy contracts they were both privately owned outpatient clinics and the owners were a lot more flexible and willing to work with us. Whereas if you were applying for a skilled nursing job or a home health job or a hospital job, it may be different. Um, especially if it, say if it was like a rural area where they really needed a full-time staff member and didn't have someone. Quite often when you apply for rural hospital jobs or um, skilled nursing, you might be the only therapist, so they would definitely need you 40 hours a week. So it really just depends on the facility, the location, and what their needs are. The key is to be flexible though, and that's what we had going for us, is we were extremely flexible. We had, I mean, we had like a whole month period where we could start any time. We would, we told the, uh, the clinic owner we could work, you know, anywhere between one day and four days a week. It's unrealistic for us to work five days a week anymore um, with doing so much with the websites but um, we, could, we could probably make three days a week work, but two days a week for each of us was perfect. Yeah. Um, now in terms of if we made enough money, you now it just depends on your um, situation financially. We made about 50% or a little bit less than what we would make at a full-time travel therapy contract. Um, I think our contracts were based on, if we'd worked 40 hours, about 1,700. And so then it was just basically prorated at two days a week. Um, we still came out pretty good because we had the tax-free stipends for part of our pay. Um, so I think we made each about like $700 a week after taxes working two days a week, which we felt like was really good. Yeah. And um, again, we're at a point of financial stability where we don't work full time anyway. We have our online business. Uh, we saved a lot in our first several years of traveling. So that may not be an option for you, but some of you guys, that could be an option. We have had people later in their careers or just in certain circumstances looking for part time. So if you can make it work financially um, and find a clinic, it, it was a great, great opportunity. 700 a week for two days a week is really not that bad. We were uh, doing the math compared to like what a permanent job would pay in our home area. And it's probably only a couple hundred dollars a week less than we'd make if we were working a perm job working 40 hours a week. So 
really not bad at all. Yeah. Now, with that said, the expenses were really high in Alaska. Um, we did a, a couple months ago when we first got there, we did a whole video talking about finding our housing and getting set up there. It was definitely very expensive. But again, we were both working. We also have our online business. So for us, we were able to make it work financially. I would say for most of you, if you are going to an expensive place like Hawaii or Alaska, where you're going to have high um, housing costs, you're probably going to want to work at, at least 36 hours to offset those costs in most yeah. circumstances. Alaska is very expensive. So we just posted an article today um, where I, I kept rough track of all of my expenses while we were there. So the road trip there, the three months there, the road trip back, it ended up being a little over four months that we spent um, away from home for that contract. And uh, in total, I spent somewhere a little over $17,000 for four months, which for some of you might not sound like a lot, uh, depending on your situation. Um, but for me, that's a ton of money. Um, it's, a, it's an expensive place to live. A lot of that is the activities we chose to do. Not everyone's gonna do everything that we, we did. We, um, we picked some expensive places to go based around national parks. Um, we're trying to go to all the national parks, so you're kind of stuck with uh, those kind of costs if you wanna do that. But uh, yeah, $17,000 for four months. That doesn't just include- Just for Jared's expenses. Just for my expenses. And that doesn't include any back home expenses like um, you know costs for our, our, our tax home and. Um, car registration, that kind of stuff, um, but just costs away. So that was, uh, it's an expensive place to be. Our rent was the most we've ever paid. Uh, gas was extremely expensive there. Food was very expensive. Um, eating out is probably twice as much as what we're used to um, in our hometown. So everything was pretty expensive, but it is a dream destination for a lot of people. Uh, specifically Anchorage, I would not say is a place that you should go um if you want to save a lot of money it's kind of a place where you it's a, a great central point to go to a lot of places in alaska um, and it's beautiful so i would look at that more as a contract that you go to to have the experience than it is to earn a lot of money um, on the other hand there are places in alaska that you can go to earn a lot of money but usually they're not the most desirable areas so uh, if you do want to go to alaska and you want to earn a lot you're probably not going to be in anchorage the high paying jobs usually don't show up there um, but every now and then you can get lucky with that. Yeah, and it really just depends. So for us, we knew that we weren't really going to come out ahead financially because when we were working part time, we were we really wanted to be in the Anchorage area. So we were trying to narrow our search down to there. We also went during the most popular time. We went during the summer. Um, I will say there are other ways that you can make a lot of money in Alaska. So if you're willing to go to some of the more remote uh, rural villages, a lot of times they pay extremely well and they also include car and housing. Um, so you have like basically no expenses except for, for food. And so some people really make a lot of money working in those more rural areas. The caveat to that is sometimes you're very secluded. You have to sometimes only you can fly in on a small plane to those areas. And so there's nothing to do around um, that you can go to on the weekends. Which So it just depends on what your goals would be. Um, unless you were able to negotiate like a four day work week in one of those outlying areas. So then you could travel on the weekends to fly to somewhere else in Alaska. That would be a possibility. The other strategy you could use is if you did want to be somewhere more central like Anchorage or within a couple of hours of Anchorage, you can negotiate a longer contract and usually you can make a, a bit more money if you're willing to maybe start in the winter and go into the summer doing like a six or nine month contract. They'll pay more because if you can sign on and, and help them out through the winter where they have more trouble finding staff, you'll get a higher rate. Same thing with housing on the other side, flip side of that, you can save on housing by committing to a six or nine month lease starting in the winter or in the fall um, or sometimes even in the spring. If, if you're just not looking for those three really busy months like we were, um, that's kind of how we got screwed on housing. We were looking for the three most popular months. A lot of the options are already taken, but we've heard of a lot of travelers who found a lot more affordable housing, um, especially by starting a little bit in the off season. So th those are some strategies you can use to try to make more. Something to take into account though, if you do that, if you stay there six months, is that means that you'll likely be driving into Alaska. Um, most people choose to drive because you want to have most of your stuff in your car. Some people fly, depends on where you're going. If you're going somewhere at one of the remote villages, obviously you can't drive, so you're going to be flying there. But I would say for most people, they're, they're driving there. Um, you're probably going to be driving in some sort of bad weather, either there or on the way back. And um, that's something we ran into driving up there in May. It was still pretty snowy. So we, uh, we, it was almost like a whiteout type conditions for a while driving on one of the roads up there uh, going through northern Canada. So uh, just plan wisely. There are There's about a six month period on the Alcan where you're supposed to carry chains with you. 
uh, in your car. So, you know, think about those kind of things if you're gonna stay there six months. We wanted to avoid all that, so three months was perfect for us. And uh, it was a busy three months, but we fit pretty much everything we wanted to do in. And um, there's no way we could have done that if we were working five days a week, though. Yeah, um, but with that said, a lot of people do drive, but there are some people that if you take one of those contracts in a rural area where they're gonna provide a car, then you may not be driving. And so then you wouldn't have that so much as a factor. We knew a couple of people that worked contracts where they provided a car and they flew there from the lower 48s. Um, so that wasn't really a factor for them. Diane asked, um, what's the average cost of flying between cities in Alaska? So this is gonna vary a lot because only um, some of the cities do commercial airlines go to. So only certain cities can you fly to like on Alaska Airlines or a commercial airline. Um, a lot of them are gonna be what they call bush planes, which are like the small um, propeller planes, which hold sometimes between like 10 and 20 people. Um, and those sometimes are privately operated. So we took a couple of flights like that, that that were fairly expensive to get to some of the villages. Um, but when you can fly with um, Alaska Air to some of the cities, it's a little more affordable. It's probably, um, I think we flew to Juneau from Alaska and we used points, but I think if we booked it uh, out of pocket, I think it was gonna be about $300 for a round trip. And so. then they have another local airline called Raven, and I want to say the folks that flew on that it was it was more affordable yeah. um, to like our friend that was in Valdez. Um, so I'm not sure. It's a lot cheaper, but the options are limited. So uh, Hawaii has an airline like that too. It's like a budget airline. Um, it's very laid back. It's cheaper. the the uh, The flights are not as good. So like the you know you don't get any kind of service or anything. But um, it's a, a cheap option. Pro tip though, if you're somebody who is thinking about going to Alaska and also if you have any family and friends that want to come visit you, several months ahead of time start planning and try to get you and your family members and friends to get the um, Alaska Airlines credit card. And um, I don't remember all the credit card rules for that, but I think you get a certain number of points after doing the spending requirement and you can also qualify for a companion ticket, which gives you um, a companion either for free or for really cheap. We didn't plan far enough ahead in order to get that or be able to take advantage of it personally or um, with our family members, but that would be a really good idea. It depends on how you look at it. Um, in some ways, we planned way ahead because I got an Alaska Airlines card in 2016 <laughs> that I had miles that we used. So we actually were able to fly. And that was just Jared miles. doing credit card schemes. Yeah. We had no intention of going to Alaska at any time. He also has a British Airways credit card. We've never flown on British since, Airways. Since 2015. Yeah, um, British, but British anyway, plan ahead, get the Alaska Airlines card and save a little bit that way. But anyway, so back to just kind of telling you a little bit more about our experience there. Um, we loved our jobs. Not only was it part time, was it really laid back, but it was all one on one care. Our clinics were great. The staff was great. The patients were great. People were just overall really kind in Alaska. We just had a wonderful experience working there. Um, we love that most of the clinics in Alaska are one on one if you're outpatient. Um, the caseloads tend to be pretty laid back. The people tend to be pretty laid back. So we really enjoyed working there. I think every therapist knows that there are, uh, you every now and then get pretty difficult patients. And this is the first place I've ever worked at where I didn't have even one patient that I thought was like overly difficult or rude or anything like that. So um, I don't know if we just got lucky. I don't know if I was in a, just a very good area of town and the clinic we were at, but um, it was a, a really good clinic and uh, we would definitely would work there again. Um, the nicest patients I've ever interacted with. Yeah, we're definitely gonna keep in touch with the clinic owner where we worked. We would certainly be open to going back if the opportunity ever worked out with our time and our schedules um, to go back and work part-time for them again. Um, a lot of people have asked us if they could get the information. Unfortunately, they don't usually use travelers. This was a very unique situation. And so I think that um, the clinic owner would only be willing to work with somebody who only wanted part-time or something flexible like that. Of course, that could change, but generally he doesn't use travelers um, for full-time work. Um, the other cool thing about being in Anchorage was there's so many other travelers in the Anchorage area. We easily met up with 30 plus travelers um, on the weekends in Anchorage and the surrounding areas within an hour or so. And that's just the ones that like either followed us on Instagram or we knew from Instagram or Facebook or something like that. There's probably a lot more. Um, and that was mostly just therapists. There was only a couple of travel nurses that we met there. And I know there's a lot of travel nurses in the area. So yeah, probably about a, probably, 30 or more travel therapists in the Anchorage area within a couple hours in the summer, which is crazy. I, yeah. I don't know if there's anywhere like that except maybe like the Bay Area of California has a ton of travelers. 
Um, so that was awesome being able to meet up with so many people and travelers are always really cool people to meet up with. Yeah, we've never worked anywhere like that before where there were so many other travelers. And like Jared said, we've heard of it happening more in like on the West Coast, like California, some of the bigger cities there, uh, maybe Seattle, maybe Portland, a couple of those bigger cities. Um, but we've never been around that many travelers before, so that was really awesome. If you ever decide to take a job near Anchorage or within the surrounding area, there's probably going to be a lot of other travelers there too. Um, as far as Alaska itself, um, it was just stunning. Um, before we had gone to Alaska, we had been to a lot of national parks. We've been to, well, actually Alaska was our 50th state. So we've been to all 49 states. We'd seen a lot of beautiful things. And we've, we tried to rank all the national parks that we'd been to before going to Alaska. Um, and a lot of our top ones, probably our top five, the reason why we liked them and ranked them the highest was because we really enjoy beautiful, stunning mountains. For example, before going to Alaska, our favorite national park um, was North Cascades. And North Cascades is in the very north part of Washington, in, in um, Washington State, almost to Canada. So basically in, in the Rockies there. Um, we, so just to give you an example, that was our favorite national park because we were just like, wow, it's so beautiful, these mountains, these glaciers, everything. As soon as we drove through Canada to get to Alaska, we were like, oh, all of Alaska is like Glacier National Park, or not Glacier National Park, but um, North Cascades. Like the whole state is just stunning. Not necessarily the whole state, but definitely a good portion of it. You just see these amazing mountains right from the road, these glaciers, it's everywhere. It's just beautiful. I can't remember if I told the story in the last video we did about Alaska, but it was very funny because we were driving through Canada. We went past a national park in Canada on the way there, and that's actually where I proposed to Whitney. And the reason I proposed there, I was planning to do it in Alaska, is because we got to this national park. It was very quiet. Uh, it was beautiful. It was probably one of the most beautiful things we'd ever seen. And I was like, wow, no one talks about this Canadian national park, Kluane. It's so beautiful. Can't believe nobody talks about it. And then we talked about that for a couple of days on our drive up to Alaska. And then I was like, wait a minute, everyone that goes past Kluane goes to Alaska afterwards. So probably Alaska is more beautiful than this, and that's why no one talks about it, and that's pretty much the case. It's uh, Kluane is beautiful, but almost all of Alaska is beautiful. So uh, I shouldn't say all of Alaska, because there's a lot in the middle of the state that is pretty flat, and uh, extreme temperatures, really hot in the summer, really cold in the winter, probably not places you want to be, but there are there's a ton of beauty all around the Anchorage area. Yeah, if, for those of you guys that may not be familiar with Alaska, only part of the state is on what they call the road system. They just call it the road system because there's only there's a significant part of the state that, that is not accessible by roads, by highways. Um, so only part of it, so when you drive from Canada and you go through and you pass a place called Toke, and then you can drive down to Anchorage and then it splits off and you can go to Valdez. So the drive to Anchorage is stunning. The drive to Valdez is stunning. And then, or you can turn up and you can go to um, Fairbanks. There's one section of that road that we did not take, but the way from Anchorage, the other way to Fairbanks, also stunning. And so pretty much any of those roads that are on the major road system. Um, oh, and then when you go south from Anchorage to go down to what's called um, Kenai the, the Kenai Peninsula, that's stunning. So pretty much any of those areas that you can drive to on the major road system are stunning. Yes. Just gorgeous mountains, glaciers, everything. Now, when you fly and you go west um, to the outskirts where the villages are, it does get flatter out that way and it doesn't look quite the same. But most places that you're going to go in Alaska are just really beautiful. And it kind of makes me feel bad for the people that were born around Anchorage. And I talked to some of the patients about that because it's like, you're born here this is like the pinnacle like there's not many places in the world that are this beautiful if you if you go from there to like where we're from in virginia it'd be like wow this is terrible but you know virginia is still beautiful in its own way it's just like your comparison is a uh, uh, comparison's the thief of joy i guess so once you've had that amazing beauty it's uh, it's really hard to go anywhere else and a lot of the people end up either going staying there or going somewhere like colorado that also has amazing mountains yeah so we definitely loved our three months there granted we were there during the best time in terms of weather and so we said basically in about like two to two and a half months of our three months the weather was perfect we had a few weeks it was really rainy and we were kind of like oh gosh if it was like this year round if it was like these two months year round we would have a hard time deciding not to live there because it, it would be perfect but with that said, um, when it is rainy, when it is cold, we're not really sure. There are people that say they really love the winter there, especially people that do winter sports. If you're a skier, if you like snowshoeing, um, you can go out and explore ice caves and um, you can go um, snowmobiling and all kinds of things. So 
dog sledding, like there's lots of things. You can watch the Iditarod. So there's a lot of people that do enjoy it in the winter, but the darkness is also a factor because it does get really dark and stay dark for a long time in the winter. So there's pros and cons. We absolutely loved it during the summer, but um, if we were not at the point in our travel careers where we are now, we would have stayed there for longer. We would have tried to do a six month or a nine month. And so for most of you guys, if you get an opportunity, I would try out the other seasons just to see, stay a little longer. Yeah. Um, but definitely the summer we thought was awesome. Yeah, and a question we got a lot was about the light and darkness. And um, you have to remember that Alaska is massive. So sometimes people forget that. Um, it's twice the size of Texas and Texas is huge. So, you know, it's like if you put Alaska in the middle of the country, it takes up a lot of the United States. And so it's not like you can generalize because Anchorage is different than further south, like down towards Seward. And it's different than further further north like uh, Fairbanks and even way further north than that. Um, so the state's massive. And in terms of light and darkness, that changes a lot, how high you are in the latitude, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I get God. latitude and longitude confused. Yeah. But um, the further north you go, the darker it is in the winter and the lighter it is in the summer. So Anchorage gets like five hours of darkness at the, um, the peak of summer and like five hours of light at the peak in the winter. Um, but darkness is like, it's really like maybe 30 minutes of real darkness and then all the rest is like kind of um kind of twilight. like yeah twilight bluish in the, in the sky and i'm sure the winter is probably similar you get daylight but probably a lot of it is kind of like a dawn dusk type situation mm -hmm. so um but if you go further north if you go all the way north um what barrow. is it barrow uh they get a full i think it's 60 days of darkness in the winter and a full 60 days of sun in the summer so depending on where you are in, in uh, Alaska, the light situation is going to be very different. And that's something that if you are going to be there in the winter or you're going to be in there summer, think about it because you might think, oh, 24 hours of daylight, that's great. It was kind of weird for us. It made us feel strange because, um, you know, it's 12, it's midnight and it's still kind of light outside. And that really threw us off in the beginning. We got used to it after a few weeks, but it was strange in the beginning. And I would imagine all that darkness would also be very weird. The other thing that we didn't touch on as far as like places that you could go, so there's the whole um, Southeast Alaska, which is like where Juneau is, and there's islands out that way. A lot of that is kind of like the Pacific Northwest. Um, it's beautiful in its own way from what we've heard, cool towns, but you are a little bit secluded because a lot of those places you, you can only fly to. Um, also, it's quite rainy there from what we understand. There's also some other islands south of the Kenai Peninsula, like um, Kodiak Island and some other islands down there. We've heard really great things about those places, but it just kind of depends on what your goal is in going to Alaska. Our goal was to be in a central area so we could drive to a lot of places and see a lot of the state in a short time. Um, we had friends that lived on Kodiak Island for three years and they said it was just the best place in the world. They absolutely love it. But granted, they didn't go outside of there much. So it just kind of depends on what your goal is. Um, I do think that there would be something beneficial in being in some of those more secluded areas. You would get to know the community a lot better. Um, and you would have a more immersive experience and you could just plan to go to the other areas of Alaska some other time if that if that wasn't your particular goal for that contract. So I think there's pros and cons of going to different parts. Yeah, one of the main goals we had obviously was going to the national parks like I mentioned. When we went to Alaska, we had been to 51 of the 63 national parks and there are eight national parks in Alaska and a lot of them are very difficult to get to. Um, probably there's only a few that are pretty easy to get to. Um, and, and that depends on what you mean by easy because they're, they're usually like a three or four hour drive, but some you have to fly to. So um, that was difficult in its, in, on its own. So if we had taken a contract somewhere where we had to fly to get to Anchorage and then to try to get from there to the parks, it would have been impossible. There's no way we would have been able to do it. So um, with that goal in mind, going to Anchorage was, our, uh, was a, a no brainer for us. That's where we wanted to be. Yeah. So we want to get into telling you about some of the highlights of the things that we did, some of our favorite things that we did in Alaska. Um, that way, if you guys want to write some of those down for recommendations for your own future, whether it's um, a contract or it's, it's just a trip. Um, before we do that, if you are watching live, we'd love if you'd give us a thumbs up. Just hit the heart button or the thumbs up button. We'd appreciate it. Also, if you want to leave us a comment and just say hi, um, let us know if you're thinking about going to Alaska in the future. Are you a current traveler? Are you someone who would take a contract there? Are you thinking about traveling? Um, do you just want to go there for a vacation? Um, let us know. We'd love to hear from you um, if you guys are watching live. Yeah, and you have, if you have any questions about Alaska, about our assignments, um, about anything travel related, feel free to ask those as well. Yep. Hey Gage, hey Allison, hi Melanie, 
Hi Dave, hi Lori, hi Serena, hi Allie, hey Kathleen, hi Cassidy, hi Anna, hi Kim, hi Leanne, hi Jordan, hi Armin, Linda, Melanie, a bunch of you guys hopped on, Lauren, Chelsea, Belinda, Alice, Spencer. All right, say hey in the comments, let us know you're there. Um, oh, something else that I wanted to say and I just forgot. Um, it'll probably come back to me. Okay. So some of our favorite things that we did there, um, I would say definitely top of the list is the national parks. Every national park that we went to was incredible. And after we went to Alaska, we found it very difficult to continue trying to rank the national parks, particularly because every single one in Alaska is very unique. It wasn't necessarily what we had been used to before. Before we were just kind of like, well, the national parks that are kind of like prairie or like flat or like caves, we're not really into that. But the ones that have really beautiful mountains and glaciers, those are our favorites. So that helped us like rank them. But in Alaska, actually, a lot of the areas where there's beautiful mountains and glaciers, they aren't necessarily designated as national parks. Those are just like regular hikes that we do on the weekend or go during the week. Whereas a lot, a lot of the national parks that we went to were something else. It was like you took a boat there to see glaciers or you flew there to see bears. Um, so it was a lot of really unique experiences. So it's really hard to say which ones were our favorites. Yeah, we're eventually gonna try to rank all of them. We, we have four national parks left to go in the United States now. Um, and we'll try to rank them, but it is very difficult because yeah, how do you compare seeing 20 bears on a river versus seeing uh, hiking on a glacier? It's like very difficult comparison. And then how do you compare that to like some of the national parks in Hawaii that are just beautiful, your own volcanoes. So um, it's hard to rank national parks, but we'll, we'll try to do our best. But yes, they're all very unique. They're difficult to get to, they're expensive, but uh, most of them are definitely well worth going to. Um, so some of our favorites though, I mean, again, they were all really amazing, but I'd say probably the most memorable that a lot of you guys may or may not have heard of is called Katmai. And that's the one where if you've ever seen the pictures of a lot of bears in a river that are just basically right there, that was just incredible. If it you was ever amazing. have seen a picture of a bear catching a fish in its mouth, it's probably there. Um, so if you ever get a chance in your life to go to Katmai, it was amazing. Um, it was so fascinating to watch these bears fishing for salmon in the river um, and just interacting with one another. They didn't care about the people because they're really used to the people being there. You're on a viewing platform, so you're relatively safe. There is always a chance you could have a bear encounter, but um, we didn't hear about anybody really having any issues. Um, it was stunning. It was amazing. I will say it was a little touristy. Um, they've definitely made it to where it is touristy. Um, so it wasn't, you know, I don't know. There's a balance. It's like you kind of want it to be safe and touristy in a way because you don't want the bears to kill you. Um, but it was really amazing. Uh, yeah. Really incredible experience. The downside of that one is that it is very difficult to book. You have to book way in advance. The dates are limited. Um, they can easily get canceled because of weather. It's a small bush plane you have to take to get there. Uh, we actually had to take two separate planes to get there, a bush plane and then a, um, a float, float plane. plane to actually land there. And then on top of that, it's over $1,000 per person to go on a day trip. So it's by far the most expensive national park we've ever been to. Um, I mean, there's, there's times when we've gone to 12 national parks uh, on a road trip and it costs us less than $1,000 each. So uh, if you, you know, that's a place where you only go because it's uh, something that you've been dreaming of or you want to go to all the national parks or something like that because it's, it's very costly. Yeah, definitely a bucket list type place, but um, very expensive. Um, some, one of them that is a bit lesser known that we also really loved was called Lake Clark. Um, many of you guys may have not heard of Lake Clark National Park. We had not heard of Lake Clark until we started researching the ones that are in Alaska. We also had some really cool, um, relatively close encounters with bears there, but it was way less busy, way less touristy. We went fishing um, on a lake in that national park and the bears were nearby fishing too. The water was just stunning. The mountains were beautiful. It was very peaceful. We really loved Lake Clark and um, Lake Clark is very big. We only flew into a small lake within Lake Clark National Park, but there's definitely more areas of that, that that we would love to go back and explore if we ever go back to Alaska. It was really beautiful. Yeah, that one that one was awesome. Um, it's kind of close to Katmai actually. It's only maybe a hour bush plane ride or probably a little bit less than an hour to get from Lake Clark to Katmai. And to get to Katmai, you kind of fly over Lake Clark. Um, so they're very close to each other. It's it's cheaper. It's yeah, definitely less crowded. So that one actually might have liked better than Katmai. But seeing the uh, the bear catch the fish at the waterfall is also really yeah. awesome. Another really interesting one that again we'd never heard of is called Wrangell Saint Elias. 
It's actually the largest national park in the US, um, but again, it's lesser known. So in order to get to the most accessible part of Wrangell St. Elias, you go through a town called McCarthy, and we were able to join a bunch of other travelers to go for the 4th of July. If you ever get a chance to go to the McCarthy 4th of July, it was super fun, just fun. really entertaining. Um, it's a tiny little town. They do lots of games and fun things. And then while we were there, we were obviously like in the national park. We got to hike on a glacier, which we didn't have to do with a tour guide or anything, which I thought was really amazing. We could just walk to it and hike on the glacier ourselves. That was a really cool experience. And to give you an idea of how far away things are there, um, it, it looks, if you look at the map, you look like Anchorage is here and Ringo St. Elias is here. It's not that far. Um, it's about a four hour, five hour drive on the road. And then you get to a dirt gravel road that you have to go on for another two hours. So it is a, it's a huge state and it's hard to get to places. And that heart, that park is one of the more accessible ones. And it's still very difficult to get to. And, uh, and people have issues on that road all the time because it's just a long gravel dirt road, um, with a lot of opportunities to have issues with your car or tires, things like that. Yep. Um, obviously, the national park that most people know about the most is Denali. So we had the opportunity to do what they call a flight seeing tour. That was a new term that we never heard, flight seeing. So you take a plane and they fly you over the national park to see it. Um, now, the weather really makes a difference on whether or not you can see Denali from the road or from the park or, or either from the plane, obviously, um, whether or not the weather's good enough to fly the plane. But we loved the flight scene tour. Um, they took you really low because it's a small bush plane. They take you really low, really close to the glaciers and the mountain. It was amazing. We even saw the people at the base camp who were hiking to the top of, the, um, of Denali. We could see them, there were little dots down at their camp. So that was a really fascinating experience too. That was definitely one of the, the top parks. It's and that's another hard thing to rank because in Wrangell St. Elias, we hiked onto a glacier. We actually walked out there, saw some of the beautiful blue pools that form on glaciers. Um, but then on the flight scene tour to Denali, we're flying over the glaciers and seeing Denali there. And it's just insane. It's massive. Um, so that, yeah, it's very hard to rank them, but that is also right up there. Those two probably are my favorite, I think, in Alaska were Wrangell St. Elias and Denali. Yeah, those are really amazing. Um, and then we have a couple that we went on boat tours. So we were flying and we were hiking and we were seeing bears and we were walking on glaciers and then we're taking boat tours to glaciers that meet the ocean and seeing a lot of um, sea life, which was really amazing. We saw whales and sea otters and seals and sea lions and birds and all kinds of things. Um, those were at Kenai Fjords and Glacier Bay, which were both, again, really amazing. You're out on this beautiful bay, this beautiful water, seeing this amazing sea life. So that was another really, really cool experience. Um, and then we also went to the two that are above the Arctic Circle. So this is where we got to see a different part of the terrain and go to some of the outlying villages um, by flying, going all the way up to Fairbanks and then flying to a smaller village and then flying over some other even smaller villages. So that was just an incredible experience too. That was also flight seeing, just flying over top of the national parks. Yeah, those two in the north would be the ones I would do very last. If you were in Alaska, you want to see a bunch of amazing things. They're difficult, very difficult to get to, really expensive again. I think for the two flight seeing tours going over those two parks, it cost us about $2,200 $2, each, something like that. So very expensive and uh, not something I would do unless you really just, you know, you're trying to go to all the national parks. That's the reason we did it. Um, because the other parks are probably just as impressive, probably more beautiful, cheaper, and easier to get to. Yeah, and I will point out that we did more than most people ever do in Alaska unless they have a goal of going to the national parks because there's so much incredible stuff to do that's free or easily, more easily accessible or not thousands of dollars, might be a couple hundred dollars to do another type of activity. There's fishing, there's hiking, there's other glaciers you can go to that aren't part of the national parks. There's a lot you can do that is not part of the national parks. Again, that was just our goal. But when we told our boss um, that we wanted to go to all the national parks, he was like, you know, the whole state's like a national park, right? And he was completely right. He was definitely right. So you definitely don't have to spend all that money to do cool things in Alaska. It was just our goal to try to go to those national parks. So that's why we spent thousands of dollars to go to them. Some of the best views we saw in all of Alaska um, were not at national parks. Um, Hatcher Pass is a place that's easily accessible from either uh, Anchorage or even if you're in Fairbanks, you can get there fairly easy, five hour drive from Fairbanks, but like a one hour drive from Anchorage. Um, easy hikes you can do there or difficult hikes you can do and they've got some of the most incredible views we've ever seen. So 
you don't just have to pay to go to parks or do mm -hmm. things like that. You can there's hike there's endless hikes all around Anchorage. Within an hour of Anchorage, you could probably do a different hike every week for five years and uh, not do all of them. Yeah. So it's a really amazing place. So keep in mind in terms of hiking conditions, we were there from May through August and really the best hiking conditions were only in July and August where you're not gonna be in snow. Um, and then after August, even when there is snow, it's, you, you know, it gets to a point where it's like more packed down and they say that you can hike or snowshoe um, or cross country ski pretty easy when it's packed down. When it's in the spring, it's not really good because everything's thawing out. So like March, April, May is kind of a bad time to hike. Um, because you're just gonna sink into the slushy snow and it's just gonna be wet and yuck. Even into June on some of the mountain peaks, there's still a lot of snow. So if you're hiking to the top, you'll be hiking through snow. So it's kind of, uh, it's weird because June, the weather's great. It's a, it would be an awesome time to hike. And there are a lot of hikes you can do and you can hike through the snow, but um, you have to be prepared for that. And then in August, when most of the snow's melted, that's usually when the rain starts. So they kind of have a little bit of a rainy season before it goes into winter and uh, so then it's not ideal hiking weather either. So really July is the perfect time to hike there. We, we tried to take advantage of that as much as we could. Yeah, but we did some amazing hikes. Fishing was also so cool. We don't have a lot of fishing experience. I mean, we'd grown up in Virginia and you know maybe gone on the lake or like on a dock with our family when we were young or something, but nothing really like, oh, just you throw a line and you lean the pole up against the dock. That was like my experience with fishing. We did some of the coolest fishing. It was so amazing to be able to catch these wild Alaskan salmon with your own pole. Like you're, we were wading in the river. Um, such a cool experience to be able to cook your own fish. Um, so that was so cool. We did, like I said, we didn't have fishing experience, but we had people that taught us and showed us and we bought all the gear. We also had the chance to go deep sea fishing um, for halibut and that was incredible as well. We also caught fish that we weren't familiar with called rockfish that were delicious. So fishing was another really cool thing that I wasn't even really expecting to do um, with Alaska, but we loved it. Shout out to Ryan, what's going on? Keeps commenting until I uh, acknowledge him. <laughs> hey, Ryan. Um, so just endless outdoor adventure to be had. Um, as you can see, hiking, fishing, glaciers, boat tours, flight seeing tours, um, lots of cool stuff. Obviously there's other cool things there, good seafood to eat, breweries, lots of fun things to do. So um, we had a blast. Um, I know what I, I remember what I was going to say earlier that I forgot to say. If you're somebody who's like, I don't know if I'm going to go there for work, but maybe I'll plan a vacation. A lot of people think, oh, the easiest way to go to Alaska would be to take an Alaskan cruise. Now, we haven't taken an Alaskan cruise. We've done some boat tours that were just day tours, which were amazing. But what we didn't realize when we did do some research about Alaskan um, cruises is a lot of them only go to southeast Alaska. They don't even come up close to Anchorage or the other parts of Alaska. So, and that's just because it's massive and it's not really feasible to make it. I mean, it would have to be like a, a month long cruise to make it all the way up near Anchorage if you're starting somewhere uh, around Washington or something like that. So um, yeah, most of the cruises are just going in Southeast Alaska, which is definitely beautiful. And everyone we've ever talked to that has done Alaskan cruise says it's amazing, but you're really not seeing most of Alaska. You're seeing like the, the part of it that's very similar to the Pacific Northwest. Mm -hmm. So with that said, I, I think that we would still like to do an Alaskan cruise sometime in the future to see something different, but I would also recommend if you get a chance to come to Anchorage and then do some stuff that's accessible from Anchorage too, because there's a lot to see that's accessible from Anchorage, whether you decide to take the train and see part of the countryside and go up to Fairbanks or go down the Kenai Peninsula, definitely recommend um, seeing more of the interior, the central part of Alaska as well. Yeah, so if you fly into Anchorage, run a car, if you're only there for a week or so, you can still see a lot. Um, and you can do a lot of things with good weather. Uh, you would just be very busy, but it would be awesome. Um, but there, you do have the option of driving up there as well, which uh, we'll get into. The road trip there and back was really amazing. I would definitely recommend it if you have the opportunity to do it. You just have to plan a lot of time and you have to realize that Obviously, you're not going to be working during that time, which means you're going to miss out on some pay, but it's kind of like a once in a lifetime experience to drive through rural Canada and rural Alaska in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, you would need probably at least six weeks to get there, do some Alaska stuff, get back. I would say at least two weeks on the way up, on the way back, and then two weeks in Alaska. Another option, if you don't want to do a road trip, would be, um, we think it'd be really cool to fly into Anchorage and then rent an RV and spend two or three weeks driving around Alaska in an RV, like one of those smaller ones. 
would be a really cool way to experience that would be the best way to see it we thought a lot about this because we thought about our families and how much of a great time we had and how we would recommend um, in the future if they wanted to come and see it um yeah driving or flying there renting an rv driving around the state for two or three weeks would be ideal it's going to be pretty expensive of course but you'll be able to see the most that way and you won't be like stuck in one location. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because if you find yourself like, oh, I'm going to get a hotel for two weeks in Anchorage, well, now you're kind of stuck. You have to come back to Anchorage each night. Whereas with an RV, there's so many places you can camp for free or off grid or, or pay to stay at a campground um, to travel via RV. So definitely a good option there. Yep. Okay, so we want to tell you guys a little bit about the road trip, some of the highlights on the way up and on the way back. Um, for those of you guys that are interested in like going through Canada and doing a road trip similar to what we did. Yeah, and I would say, like I said, most travelers are going to be driving through, um, through Canada to get there um, because it's, for the most part, not that feasible to take a contract and take all of your stuff on a plane. Obviously, some people do it and you can rent a car in Anchorage, but you have to remember that it's pretty expensive to do that. So you're kind of weighing the pros and cons there because if you're flying there, renting a car, it's going to be more costly than driving there, but at the same time, it's quicker. So you'll be able to work more. So um, yeah, you have to decide what you want to do there, but I would say the most travelers are going to be driving there. We thought the road trip was half of the experience anyway. Now we were coming from the East Coast, so we kind of went up through the Midwest and came back through the Midwest and went through the middle of Canada. Now there's a lot of people that if you were coming from like the West Coast, you'd see um, some parts of Canada that we did not see, like going through Vancouver and that region. Um, we still would like to explore that. We didn't get an opportunity, but on the way up, we took about 12 days. We needed, we were in a little bit of a hurry and it was May, so there's actually a little bit of snow. So we didn't do that much on the way up. Um, I would say on the way up, our highlights were layered hot springs. Definitely recommend if you go that way on the Alcan to stop at Laird Hot Springs. It was a really cool hot springs experience. Um, and then I'd say the other highlight is Kluane National Park, which is where Jared proposed to me and we got officially engaged. So that place is really special to us and it was a very beautiful national park. Yeah, those were definitely the highlights. Just driving on the Alcan in general, saw a lot of wildlife. Um, it's just, if you've never been to rural Canada. I don't think you can really explain it. Uh, it's just unbelievably um, rural. There's just nothing there. It's There's parts where you'll drive for 100 or 150 miles and not see any cars or any um, stores or anything like that. It's just, it's so rural that it's, it's, you can't even imagine something like that in lower 48. Because we thought when we drove through like, oh, Wyoming, Montana, Nebraska, you know, oh, wow, it's really rural here. And it, that's nothing compared to Northern Canada. Yukon is um, insanely rural. So it's just, it's, a, it's an interesting experience to be so far away from people. Mm -hmm. But it was really cool. So sometimes you would go through and it would be a town, but the whole town is pretty much just like um, a store. And the store might be everything. It might be a store, like a convenience store with a little bit of groceries, gas, and maybe even a lodge. And some of them are like these cool, um, wood uh, log cabin type buildings. And so you're just seeing like these really interesting little towns um, and then there could be nothing for another hundred miles. So it was a really cool experience. Yeah, one thing we learned, which we, we kind of planned a lot ahead of time and it's really nice to have the internet and resources and things like that now, um, but don't risk anything with not getting gas. Like whenever you pass a gas station, especially if you take the, the more rural route, the Cassier Highway, either going up or down, make sure to get gas whenever it's available because there are situations you might run into where there might only be one gas station for 200 miles and that gas station is out of gas or they don't have power or they're closed for some reason. We, we passed one where we needed gas and it was just like a sign on the door at 1 p.m. that said, be back at four. So, you know, like situations like that are terrible to be in. So um, ideally, even a gas can that you can have, you know, on the back of your car or something like that would be even better just in case you run into a situation where you're not able to get gas. But it was better than we we, um, we thought. It was, for the most part, we were never in a situation where we were at any risk of running out of gas. Yeah, it made me feel better. Um, we did get that mile post book that a lot of people recommended. I didn't use it that much. I used it a little bit on the way up to be like, okay, it says the next gas station is 100 miles. Something else you can do is you can download offline maps on Google Maps on your phone and it'll actually allow you to view the map even if you don't have service and you're not going to have service for a lot of the drive on the Alcan or the Cassier Highway through Canada. Um, although we did have service more than we thought we would. Yeah. I thought it would just be like 
a week of no service. We had it occasionally, but um, it made me feel better because I actually could look on the map and see when gas stations were coming up, even if I didn't have service. So download those offline maps. And if you're really a planner, you could even star or mark and save as a favorite some of the gas stations every 100 miles or so so that you make sure not to miss one. Yeah, and it's a extremely good idea to have at least one spare tire or ideally two spare tires because some of the roads are very rough um, potholes and things from that what it's called frost heaves where i guess in the winter the the ground freezes and then as it thaws out it can like crack the ground and you'll, you'll get these like cracks in the, the road and these big just mounds out of nowhere where you're like hitting a, a speed bump that yeah is not it's like there. it's like the um pavement kind of pushes up and makes like a like a speed bump yeah um and sometimes you don't expect them and you hit it pretty hard and you kind of Catch some air. Yeah, we were very lucky. We didn't have any car problems, but I could easily see how you would um, with the potholes and everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so then on the way back, we had a little bit more time. Um, we definitely wanted to hit up some national parks on the way back, so we took our time a little bit. We, instead of just taking the Alcan the whole time, on the way back, we took the Cassier for part of it. That was a lot more rural than the Alcan, but it was really beautiful. We saw more wildlife on there than we than we did on the Alcan. We saw like three or four bears, which was pretty cool, just on the side of the road. Um, and we know people that saw like a dozen bears. Um, you especially see wildlife closer to dusk. Um, so keep that in mind if you are driving. Uh, also, you don't want to hit wildlife. Uh, if you hit a moose, it's definitely going to damage your car, possibly kill you. So be cautious. Yeah, and there's a lot of moose. Mm -hmm. But it is pretty cool when you do see them on the side of the road, um, as long as you see them in advance and you don't hit them. That was a really cool experience. Um, so absolutely the highlight of our trip back was Banff National Park. So um, we went to actually three national parks. They're all kind of right there together. And then like the boundary just changes first. It's Jasper from the north. And then it's um, Banff, and then Yoho is kind of off to the side. And there's another one nearby that we didn't go to. I can't remember the name. Um, Kootenay or something like that um, that we could have gone to, but we just didn't really factor it into our plans. But of those, the one you've probably heard of is Banff, and it absolutely met all the hype. It was stunning. It was amazing. We've been to, at this point, between Canadian and United States National Parks, we've been to over 60. And uh, yeah, Banff, I think, blew them all away. So if we were ranking uh, Canadian and American national parks, I think Banff would be at the top of all of them because it really has everything. The uh, mountains, glaciers, amazing lakes, like the, the most beautiful lakes. I mean, actually, one of the lakes there, I think, is consistently ranked in the top five most beautiful lakes in the world. So mm -hmm. uh, I would highly recommend that if you, if you were never going to go to Alaska, um, go to Banff and it's it's got a little piece of Alaska right there it's it's a beautiful it's park. the Canadian Rockies so it's really similar to what Alaska looks like and it was just incredible and so if you've ever seen pictures of Banff National Park um, the two most well, there's three really famous lakes there's Moraine Lake Lake Louise and um, what was the one that looked like a wolf um, Peto or Pe Peto Lake so those three if you've ever seen pictures of them you might have thought that the person edited the pictures enhanced them that's what we thought that's what we thought we thought oh there's no way it's actually that blue it's not that turquoise it is it is it was insane um, especially if the Sun is out obviously um, it reflects more of the the blue UV rays come back at you and so it's definitely prettier when it's sunny but still pretty regardless um, they were the most beautiful lakes we've ever seen in our lives. So yeah, so that recommend. was by far the highlight of our trip back. We also wanted to stop in some of the the capitals along the way. So on the way up, we stopped stopped in Whitehorse, which is the capital of Yukon. Which interestingly enough, Yukon is a massive, massive um, territory, and it's not really a territory. I can't remember what they call it. I think it is a territory. It might be, um, but it's massive. It's like probably I'm pretty sure it's bigger than Texas or anything like that. It's a huge territory. Whitehorse is the capital. It has about half the population of the whole territory, and it's still only 48,000 people in Whitehorse. So that tells you how rural all of that area is up there. Um, so we went there, that's capital. We went to, on the way back, we went to, um, let's Calgary. see, the first place was Calgary, went to Regina, went to um, Winnipeg, Saskatoon, and on the way up. I don't up, think we went to Saskatoon. We were in Saskatchewan. But we went to Saskatoon on the way up. Oh, on the way up. Yeah, on the way up. And then we went to Edmonton on the way up too. Oh, yeah. So we got to see quite a few of the um, Canadian cities in the middle of the country. And in between those cities, it, it's another really amazing thing about Canada is you can drive between two capitals. So if you're driving from, let's say, Calgary to Regina, it's like a five hour drive, I think, or maybe six hour drive. Um, they're two capital cities near the border of the United States, you know, within a couple hundred miles, and there's absolutely nothing between them. Um, 
you might pass some small towns, but it's almost all just farmland and, and nothing. And uh, that's something hard to believe. Could you imagine driving between like Los Angeles and, uh, and or uh, what's the capital of California? Is it Sacramento? Yeah. Um, Sacramento and like uh, Seattle and there being just nothing. That's kind of how it is. So uh, it, it's amazing. It's, it's extremely rural up there. Yeah. So it's really interesting. Um, part of driving through Canada after you get past the Rockies coming east is very flat, lots of farmland. We actually kind of miss seeing farmland because there's not really a lot of farmland in Alaska because the, the temperature most of the year doesn't support it. Um, so it was kind of interesting to Which see. Which is something we didn't even think about and, uh, until we started driving back through farmland is like when you're up there, it's just a bunch of woods and, um, and mountains and things like that. And didn't really think much about it, but then you start going back through farmland again, it's like, oh, wow, yeah, yeah. cows, wow. Yeah, um, so then one of our major goals on our way back, um, as we were coming back through and getting back into the US, into the Midwest, was to go to a national park that we haven't been to yet in Michigan. So we only have a few national parks that we haven't been to, four. Um, one in Michigan, one in Florida, the Virgin Islands and um, Guam. Samoa, uh, American Samoa. Yeah, I think it's in Guam. No, it's American Samoa is its own island, separate thing from Guam. Okay. But it's in the Pacific. Yeah. Um, so anyway, four. So basically, two in the contiguous U.S. Um, one is an island in Michigan that is in Lake Superior. So it's basically between. It's they call it like the boundary waters between Canada and the U.S. Um, so we've been trying to make it to that one since 2020. We first tried to go there, planned a road trip, and went through the Upper Peninsula. And at that time in 2020, the ferry to get there was not running because of COVID. So this time we planned it way in advance. We made sure to get our ferry tickets. Everything was fine. We get there, and that morning, um, the weather, actually the weather was fine. It was sunny. Um, but the, the night before there had been a storm and so the water was too rough for the ferry to go. And this is amazing to us because if you just have like heard of the, um, Great Lakes, you're like, oh, well, like they're lakes. They're kind of big, but they're lakes. No, they're, I saw one description that called them inland seas, which is yeah. way more accurate than calling it a lake. Yeah. It really is like an ocean, but it's a, um, freshwater sea that has a current and it's huge. It has beaches. So we didn't really expect that the ferry could get canceled because the current was too rough, but it did. Yeah, and to give you an idea of how big the lakes are, Lake Superior, this uh, national park that we were trying to go to, it's an island in the middle of Lake Superior. The island is big enough that it has its own lakes on the island. So, and it's just a small, if you look at the map, it looks like a small little piece of land in the middle of the lake, but the lake is just massive. It has animals on it. It has moose and deer and other animals on it. So. Unfortunately, we did not make it. Um, we tried to figure out some way to finagle, to rearrange our plans and go. Well, we were trying to go as a day trip, um, go on the ferry in the morning, come back on the ferry in the afternoon, and it just wasn't gonna line up. So unfortunately, we missed it, and we're gonna have to try to plan a whole another trip to go back to for the Upper Peninsula to yeah. go to this national park. So that's park. the second time that national park didn't work out for us because of the ferry. And then we had another situation with the one in Florida, Dry Tortugas, that you can only get to by ferry where we were there for that one and it got canceled as well. So we have very bad luck with uh, national parks and ferries. Although I will say we got very lucky in Alaska being yes. able to get to all those, so uh, it evens out. There were a couple times where we were afraid that we weren't gonna be able to go to ones in Alaska because it really depends on the weather too. Um, and so I'm glad we made it to all the Alaska ones. We, we did get one canceled and rescheduled for the next day, um, Glacier Bay that we had to fly to um so we got lucky because now we won't have to go back to alaska to do the national parks but we will have to go back to michigan which is pretty far but not as far as alaska yeah um so after that uh we headed down through wisconsin we had been to wisconsin before but we didn't really get to explore a lot so it was cool to actually explore more of wisconsin um really beautiful state we enjoyed driving through there we went to a place called door county wisconsin which thank you to those of you guys that recommended that to us we'd never really heard of it in my opinion it was kind of basically like the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, but it's like the Upper Peninsula of, of Wisconsin because it kind of goes up by um, Lake Superior as well. And there were lots of wineries there, which was really nice, and lots of cheese, of course. Very beautiful area up there. We also stopped in Green Bay, saw the Packers Stadium. That was pretty cool. Um, and we stayed in, um, what was it? Chicago? No, uh, in Wisconsin, um, Milwaukee. Yeah, but we didn't really explore Milwaukee, just kind of drove through, stayed, stayed the night. And then our last major stop on our trip on the way back was Chicago. And again, we'd kind of like driven through Chicago before. Jared went there once when he was a kid, but I'd never been to Chicago. So that was cool. We stayed in a hotel right across from the Bean, 
So it was like very central to do the touristy stuff. We were literally there 24 hours, so we didn't do that much, but we enjoyed it. Um, saw the major sites. We did the architecture boat tour that a lot of people recommended to us. That was really cool. That was the most highly recommended thing and it was actually really cool. So glad we did that. And yeah, the beam was cool and walked around quite a bit there. Ate some deep dish pizza, which was pretty good. Still not necessarily our favorite food, but you know, when in Chicago, got to try it. So yeah, so that was pretty cool. And then that was our last major stop. And so we made our way back to the East Coast and now we're back in Virginia. So it was a very busy summer. It's uh, it's always so weird for us. We go on these trips where we're gone for three or four or five months. We've done this over and over and over again, either international trips or, you know, basically going to Alaska felt like an international trip because it's so far away. And on the way back, or when we get back, it kind of feels like we've been gone forever and also no time at all. Mm -hmm. And we're always like, did we really leave? Or have we been gone for, like some things seem exactly the same. Um, but then thinking about like all the memories and all the things we did, it seems like we were gone for eternity. Mm -hmm. So um, it's always a weird experience. I'm sure a lot of you guys experience that, experience that too. Um, but uh, that's something we're dealing with right now. We've been home for a few days and we're like, everything kind of seems the same, but it also kind of seems like completely different because we had an amazing experience this summer. Yep. Um, so yeah, it was just an amazing summer. It's hard to believe it's fall. I'm glad we got back while well, the weather's still pretty good here. It's actually still pretty warm in Virginia because it's funny, like being in Alaska all summer, um, the warmest it got was like 75. And so it's not like we were like, I don't think I wore a bathing suit once all summer. Um, the only sun that we really got is, you know, if we were hiking or fishing. Um, so it's kind of nice to come back and it's pretty warm here for a few more weeks until the fall hits. So good to be home for a bit. We're going to be home off and on for the next month. Um, for those of you guys that might be wondering what's next for us, we're going to the Travelers Conference in Las Vegas next week. So hope to see some of you guys there. Let us know if you're going to be there too. Leave us a comment or send us a message. We leave on Friday for that. So we'll be home just over a week. We go to the Travelers Conference in Vegas, come back, and then we'll be home for a couple weeks. And then we're going to Mexico for our next trip. And then we'll come back and then we're home for just about a week. And then we uh, leave on our next trip, which... We're kind of in the middle of planning that, um, but it's probably going to be a longer trip, hopefully two months or so. Yep. And Mexico is just a week, just a just a week long uh, resort type vacation, not a long trip like we've done in the past to Mexico. So just a week in Vegas, a week in Mexico, and then we'll let you know where we're going in October, probably from October through December. Still working on planning that. International though, uh, yep. not a travel contract. We're not taking any more contracts this year, probably not at the beginning of next year. We'll have to see after that. Yeah, we'll see what next year brings, but stay tuned. Um, if you guys are not already, you can follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Travel Therapy Mentor. I usually post pictures of the, our travels, especially on our stories, what we're up to um, in real time. Yep, in addition to all the giveaways Whitney already mentioned, um, we do have another giveaway coming up, um, what, this, this coming week? Oh yeah, week. this week, yep. Um, another giveaway, which is a pretty cool prize um, on Instagram, so we're gonna do an Instagram giveaway for reaching 15,000 followers um, and it'll be a good one. So if you're not following us on Instagram, follow us there. Yep. All right. Thank you guys for tuning in. Um, are there any questions about Alaska, about our road trip? Let us know in the comments if you do have any questions. Um, Betty, I saw this comment. This is a, a good comment. Uh, if you drive, I suggest people take Windex, lots, and a squeegee to keep the windshield clear of bugs. The bugs were unreal and yes, a lot of moose. Yeah, that is very true. I. I was talking about this, so we drove on the way back, it was about three weeks, and I cleaned the windshield at least 20 times. Like, pretty much every time we stopped for gas, I'd clean the windshield. So, there are a ton of bugs. It's, um, there was a time where it didn't rain for a few days, and we drove uh, probably 1,500 miles, and the front of the van was so covered in bugs that you almost couldn't read the license plate. So, it is, uh, it's kind of out of hand. Yeah, the van is a disaster. We, yeah. we have to clean it. Um, now that we're back, we have this bad habit of getting back and just parking the van outside and just Leaving forgetting it. that it yes. exists. And then in like a month, we'll be like, oh yeah, we never took all the stuff out of the van or cleaned it, so we need to make sure to clean it. Um, Ryan, thank you for the stars. We appreciate it. Um, again, if any of you guys enjoyed this video or learned anything, we'd love if you would just hit the thumbs up button and let us know. Um, if you have any questions now or later, Leave a comment and uh, we'll answer. We will go back later and answer comments. Um, let's see if there's any last comments here. Okay. All right. Well, if you guys don't have any questions, we'll wrap up. Thanks for tuning in. Um, yeah, definitely 
highly recommend Alaska, highly recommend doing a road trip through Canada if you get a chance. Yeah, I always say this every video, but we're gonna try to do a couple more videos in the coming weeks. Um, we gonna try to do another job market update probably at the beginning of October, and then probably hopefully do one more before then. Um, I'm not sure what it'll be on, but if you have any video suggestions, send us a message. We're always open to making videos about anything that you guys wanna hear about. Yeah. Uh, Melanie says, not a question, but please keep the weather nice in Virginia because I'm going to the Virginia Tech game on Thursday. Oh, nice. That's awesome. That'll be really fun. Yeah, the weather's really nice right now. I was out there walking right before the video, and uh, I think it's like uh, low 70s and a um, little humid, but it's very nice weather. Yep. All right, guys. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time. Yep. Take care.